All right, I think we are ready to roll. Hello everyone, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are, wherever the time of day, it's Cello Tip Tuesday live stream. No matter what, no matter where you are, it is time to learn some cello tips and tricks. And I'm so excited. Thank you all so much for joining me today, everyone. Let's hear how you all are doing. And yeah, I would love to hear some questions, anything you wanna ask about practicing, about music and social media, the music industry. Maybe some of you are applying to conservatories and would like some tips on that. I'm, I'm just so excited. I love doing this every single month with you all. So let's get started. And thank you for the kind words and greetings both on YouTube and Instagram chat. If you're experiencing uh, some connection errors, you can go over to YouTube and vice versa. If you're on YouTube, you can go to Instagram. So hello everyone. Do we have any questions to start? Of course, y'all know Chelly. Oh, and I just bumped my interface. Oops, that's fine. Y'all know Chelly. And yes, Chelly is always excited to see their dolls as well. So, any questions today? Anything? I am just keeping an eye on both of these chats. Excellent. So, does anyone have any practicing things they would like to share? You can also share some successes, some things that are kind of challenging and you want some help on. Oh, we got a question here on Instagram. Could you tell me what the proper height for my cello should be? That's an excellent question. So cello height is going to vary depending on your height, right? All of our bodies are beautiful and different. So the way we interact with the cello has to be different. So there are some general guidelines that you can use to kind of gauge your posture and where that cello is supposed to go. So couple things you can do. And also I have a YouTube video on this cello posture. I will include that in the, um, in the video notes on YouTube. So start off taking out the end pin, which is on the bottom, take it out. And what you can do is sitting on the edge of your seat, very important, being on the edge of your seat. So actually, you dolls are gonna make me work. I'm gonna go, <laughs> I'm gonna go this way for this question because it's very important. <laughs> so, all right, so I got my, and pin out. Of course, I've been playing for a couple decades, wowza, so mine's already at a good height, but I'm sitting on the edge of my chair. And if you can see, my legs are forming a right angle or like a square. You don't want triangles, you don't want your legs out flat. Nice, strong, sturdy. Imagine if someone came on the live stream and they just saw me doing this. They're like, chill it all. What are you doing? <laughs> it's relevant and educational. So I'm on the edge of my seat. Very important. Um, this is going to help you to strengthen those back muscles. So we don't want to be slouching in the chair because then your back won't get strengthened. So edge of the chair. My legs are those nice square shapes. And I'm going to put the tailpiece on the floor in between my legs. And I'm going to pick something random that I know is not going to be right. So I'm going to try this. 
and this is where I am right now. So the corners on the back of your cello, you have these little corners here and here, and you want those to fall on the inside of your knees. So right now you guys can probably see my scroll is way behind my head. That's not quite right. But these corners are touching my thighs. We want them on the knees. So what that means is I got to drop the angle of my cello. Okay, and now my corners are by my knees. And you want to play with your cello at a little tilt to your right. So not straight out from the stage. It will look like your cello is straight out, but, uh, okay, good. Follow up question. I will get to that. Thank you. Awesome. So, uh, where was my knowledge? Where was I? Uh, corners are on the inside of the knees. Oh yes, the tilt. From the stage, if you watch a cello player, it's gonna look like it's straight out, but actually it's just a tiny tilt to the right, just a tiny tilt. Now, right now, because I've been playing for a while, I can tell my cello is a little bit low. So I like the angle this way, uh, this way versus this way. That's the angle. So that's one adjustment you can make. A lot of students think they just have the end pin to work with, but you also have how steep you want the cello to be. So that can be helpful. And the reason I know this is too short, the end pin is too short because I can feel the peg is almost touching my neck. It's really close to my neck. And the peg is usually closer to your ear. It's closer to your ear. Your bottom peg should be near your ear. So I know I also can feel the cello feels a little low on my chest. It's kind of on my upper stomach. And I usually have this part sitting at the top of my rib cage is where this hits for me. Now granted, that could be because of the size of my torso. So take that with a grain of salt. So I am going to take my tailpiece. I'm going to make it a little bit longer. Adjust your end pin maybe an inch at a time, nothing crazy. So I'm going to try this again. I'm going to put those, these back corners on my knees. And now it might be, might be a little bit tall. So I'm going to find a sweet spot in between. And there we go. The peg is by my ear. And this is kind of the basics of how to sit with your cello. Now I will say, of course, I started cello when I was eight. So that was a while ago, but I do think it took me a couple years before sitting with a cello felt automatic. And I did say years, about two years. So if you've been playing for about a year and you go, you know, it still feels kind of weird when I sit with this, then that's completely normal. So don't let that discourage you in any way. And yeah, so it will take some time to feel comfortable. Now, the person who asked this question on Instagram mentioned they have a seven eighths cello and seven eighths is a rarer cello size, but they absolutely exist. They absolutely exist. And they asked, well, are there gonna be any differences? Because yes, Chelly is a full size, however, Chelly is on the smaller side, a um, little narrower, so kind of a small full size. And I will say the guidelines I gave you shouldn't really change if you're playing on a seven eighths, because I'm guessing you might be on a seven eighths um, in general, uh, petite players, shorter players, um, players who might be in late high school, 
might have a couple inches left to grow, you might be assigned a seven eighths. And that's totally fine. So if you were given that recommendation, it should fit your body proportionally. So everything I told you, good. Okay, this person mentioned, yes, I am shorter. So all these things I'm talking about, the, the corners on the legs, uh, the peg by your ear, um, feeling the, this kind of little bump here that's on the back, feeling that at the top of your rib cage, all of this should be fairly proportional, even though you might be on a seven eighths. Hello to those of you on YouTube. Hello. I'm seeing some more activity in the YouTube chat. That is wonderful. So that is a very quick overview on posture. Again, um, if you go to my YouTube channel, I do have a video on how to sit with your cello and common mistakes. So wonderful. And I'm going to turn around normally. <laughs> oh, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. Uh, usually on my YouTube vlogs, I do this fun video transition, but you're going to see me awkwardly <laughs> do it manually. So we're going to go back to facing forward. Okay. So, all right. That looks pretty good. So there was a question on YouTube. Uh, just curious, how long have you been playing the cello? I have been playing the cello for 20 years. This August will make it 21 years. Ah! <laughs> 21 years. Um, so I started when I was eight and I'm 28 years old right now. And yes, I absolutely love this instrument. It's my livelihood. I'm in for the long haul, baby. And I actually had an interest in stringed instruments when I was, uh, the earliest stories from my parents about me being interested in string music. I was about one and a half or two years old. My older sister played violin. So pretty much very soon after my birth, I was hearing string music throughout the house. And when I was one and a half, I took my sister's violin and I sat on a little stool. I put it vertically and I just started playing it like a cello. It's a mystery <laughs> why I did that, honestly. But I really felt ready to commit to lessons when I was eight and that, you know, eight years old, I was still a child, but I had the maturity to understand to some extent the commitment of music lessons and immediately I was hooked. And so I consider eight years was when I started playing cello regularly. That's when I started taking lessons when I was eight. Before that, I would maybe noodle around on the violin, like at holidays, just having fun with family. So not really a whole lot. I started uh, training when I was eight. And a little backstory about cello. But yes, I've been playing for 20, going on 21 years. Excellent question. So do we have other questions? What are you all practicing? You're not practicing if you're on this live stream. I'm totally kidding. It's fine. This is educational. So in a way you are getting knowledge. I'm going to try my best to give you some knowledge and some helpful tips. So in a way, shh, Shelly, I'm talking. You always do this. You will talk in a second. I'm just totally kidding. <laughs> Oh, someone says they're playing Popper. Yay! I love Popper. For those of you who don't know, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Popper Etudes. So I started looking into Popper Etudes when I was in high school. So 
uh, maybe 15 years old, 16, I started the Popper Etudes. And these are really great for intermediate and advanced players. So I played Popper Etudes from high school through undergrad and master's, a little bit of my master's degree. And the Popper Etudes are a great way to challenge yourself because um, the way etudes are designed are they exercise a small group of cello techniques and they will uh, popper takes a couple specific techniques and composed an etude where in learning this short piece of music you are exercising these etudes so a way you can think about it um, especially, you know, I, I love that some of my dolls here aren't musicians or don't play an instrument because I love sharing this. So I'm going to take it and kind of put it in a more general analogy. Uh, for those of you who like football, American football, I love watching football. And fun fact, so when you see... Um, sports center or anything on the news relating to sports and you see behind the scenes footage of a football team and they're doing these drills where they're running in and out of ladders on the ground like rope ladders and they go in and out or the the defense will they have these um kind of plush humanoid size things and they run into them and they push those are kind of like what etudes are. They're preparing you for, <laughs> I love it. I connected etudes to American football. Um, they're preparing you for the game or they're preparing you for the real life experience of the repertoire. So that's a little bit about etudes. Popper, um, Popper is an excellent collection of etudes. The Lee L double E, Lee Etudes. Those are a great collection of Etudes. And I believe I've played the whole Popper book. It's kind of a rite of passage for a cellist. You will play through the whole Popper book and you don't have to go in order. You know, I often just kind of did what my teacher assigned me, you know, when I was younger. And we would hop around the book depending on what kind of techniques I needed to work on. So the popper book is great. You can challenge yourself and go through it in order or kind of look around and see what, what kind of skills you want to work on. Um, excellent. Yes. Popper is a great resource. So I'm glad you are, you are learning and experiencing the popper etudes. So, what other questions do my dolls have? I need, I need some hydration, so. Oh my gosh. Talking for a long time really, really does a number on your voice. Mmm. Okay. We have a comment here on YouTube shopping for a new cello right now for college and they are thinking about their budgeting. Okay. So, uh, okay. Before I get to the question about, um, the cello buying, someone made, um, a good comment about the popper etudes. Um, I guess I better look at the popper and more etudes. I'm only on Suzuki book two. There is no shame in being on Suzuki book two. I'm, excuse me. Um, I mean, not every cellist has grown up with the Suzuki books, but those of us who have, we've all played in the Suzuki books. You know, I was in Suzuki book two and I would say the popper etudes are kind of, if, if you plan on going through 
all of the Suzuki books. Popper can come into the mix when you're maybe on the last book, the last book or second to last book. Um, I would say Popper Etudes are for experienced intermediate to younger advanced. I mean, I still sometimes crack open my Popper book and look at it. Um, so if you are just in the beginning of the Suzuki book, I would recommend waiting a little bit longer for your journey into Popper. And again, Popper, Popper and I, we hang, we hung out for about, I don't know, seven years regularly. So you will be in Popper etudes for a long time and you will definitely play some of them more than once. So I would say, you know, Suzuki books really get through the majority of them before going on to Popper. And I'm gonna circle back to the question on uh, cello shopping. Cello shopping on a budget. And <laughs> I promise, I'm saying this because I really want you to have resources and more information. I also have two vlogs on my YouTube channel about Okay, I got another question, excellent. Um, I do have a vlog on um, buying cellos. It's a two-part vlog. And again, this I'm trying to make an archive of resources for you dolls and tell you to check out the YouTube channel for those of you on Instagram. And buying a cello is an investment, it's a commitment, it's a really, really big decision. And I'm glad you're thinking about budgeting because that was something I had to think about when I was looking for a cello. And I was younger, I was about 16 when I got Chelly. So Chelly was my first purchase cello. Yay! And I too bought Chelly for college. And, you know, I was 16 years old. So, you know, my parents, were involved in the idea of buying a cello because I was younger and you know budget was something we often talked about. So how can you save money buying a cello? I would contact, um, if you already know what college you're going to, step one, contact your professor. Tell them you're interested in getting a new cello, your cello, a cello that will be with you throughout college. You want a higher leveled, young professional quality instrument. So that, tell them your plan, tell them where you're located versus where the school is located. Because if you live in a major metropolis and you're going to a school that is a little bit more maybe um, in a part with more nature and maybe not a lot of options for instrument shops, you should go shopping in your clothes, include New York City, Boston, Chicago, uh, San Francisco, Los Angeles, kind of the big, big metropolises. I'm not as familiar with the South um, because I haven't lived um, in that part of the country. I'm speaking in terms of America. And where you're living versus where the school is and ask, where do you think I should go cello shopping? Because my cello teacher recommended me to someone and that's how I found Chelly. So you can talk to your current teacher if you're still in high school. You can talk to your current or future teacher if you know where you're going for college and see what they recommend. And it took me about a year to two years of trying out cellos. So if you spend a lot of time trying out cellos, that is okay. It's like dating and finding a spouse. 
you will find a lot of frogs before you find your match. So be prepared to go looking for around a year. And if the school year is approaching really quickly and you're thinking, man, school's starting, I want a better instrument, but I, I haven't found anything I'm in love with, then rent. Rent an instrument while you are in college. It is okay to do for a short while while you are instrument shopping. I knew some people in college who were playing on various cellos for a whole semester or two semesters. That's okay. So if you're looking to be on a budget, then rent, rent your instrument while you're starting school and actively searching. Okay, I really hope that helps. Good luck. It's an exciting journey, but it's one of patience and time. So, excellent. Let's see. Um, okay, people on YouTube and Instagram, I'm trying to get to your questions in order that they appear. So if you gave a tip, I do, if you asked a question, I do see it. I am going to get to it. So please, people don't have to, I see them, I promise. I will get to your tip and your question. So somebody asked about do pour seven. All right, all right, all right. Do pour, oh, someone asked about a couple different etudes on YouTube. You know, I have not looked at those etudes. Huh. I'm gonna write those down after this stream. I would be very interested. So I'm gonna quickly look at this. I don't have my do pour book handy. So I'm gonna quickly look up, what are we, do, what are we working with here? Oh, yes. Yes, 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 okay. Do pour seven. So someone asked a question on, can you give a tip for do pour seven with two notes for a bow? So for those of you who might not be familiar with do pour seven, okay, it's very much like the first Bach cello suite where you have four 16th notes that are slurred together. So let me see. I'm going to give my version um, modeled after Bach. And this is a great exercise to prepare you for the Bach cello suite uh, G major prelude. So, so it goes, and that's just the first measure, but already there's a lot of skills here that we can break down. String crossings, string crossings. So there are a couple different bowing variations. You might play, what I did was four. And you can also do two, which is um, maybe what you're doing on YouTube, who asked about two bows. And with string crossings, you want to have the activity at the bow being calm. So you don't want to have this going on, like, um, make the arc. And I do this exercise for the first Bach cello suite as well. Play chords, two notes, two notes. So we have playing them as two 
G and D string to D and A string double stops. And you are saying to your bow, hey, that's as much as you have to move to get to all three of these strings. So by playing a double stop, you're kind of tricking yourself into playing a smaller amount this way. And then, stop. We're working on do pour seven for those of you joining us. So you can hear the three notes. But it's kind of in between a double stop and single notes. And then take a little more of the double stop out. But don't go crazy with the bow. Stay with that smooth um calmer bow, not a big vertical thing going on. Okay, so this is really broken out chords as 16th notes. So you can play the chords to tune the left hand and then with the right hand, really focus on those calm, the calm string crossings. So let me see, let me see. Ah, okay. So, okay. So it looks like this person for the du poor starting up bow, two notes for bow legato. By two notes, do you mean two sixteenths or two beats? Because I'm wondering if you, you are playing. Or um, if you are doing two beats per bow. Because it's gonna really affect your bow speed and bow conservation, so let me know. And two beats is, that's two beats. So, yeah, that would help me to give you some tips on bow conservation, which is another big can of worms. If we're talking about bow conservation versus bow speed. Oh, sorry. On Instagram, my phone fell down. Uh, the streaming life. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay, so while I wait on that comment about the Dupour, does anyone else have any questions about what you're practicing? But the, the Dupour is a good etude. Especially it's, it's styled, it's written a lot in the style of Bach, so that's a good one for Dupour. Any more questions? I'm gonna check through on the Instagram. 
I don't see any new questions in the Instagram chat. Yeah, this dupe pour is awesome. And another thing I will say about the dupe pour is look for notes that are changing. There are a lot of notes that are repeated within the chord, but one note is changing and that's the note you wanna bring out. So let's keep going with this. Oh, there is a question. Okay, great. I'll get to that in a second. So for the note changes, you want to have, you want to see, go through each measure and see what the hidden melodic line is, what notes are changing. So. And everything else around it is repeating. So I would play it once leaning into the changing note. Don't accent it harshly, but. Okay, so I could do measure two a little bit better because it changes. It's now the middle voice. Okay, before we have the lower. Okay, so you want to make sure you don't lose that when you play it faster. So you can do that by giving a little extra bow speed and don't dig in with your weight too much, otherwise it's going to sound like a bunch of small accents. So... So we're going to start lower voice, middle voice in bar two. So okay, so a little bit of extra bow speed on those changing notes. And I'm going to check on YouTube really quick. Okay. Oh, you're most welcome. You're most welcome. So we had a question on Instagram about the bow hand thumb. It's a hard, it's a hard thing to um, get comfortable with. So it is a long-term goal, the thumb. And a big common problem with the thumb is squeezing with the thumb. Squeezing with the thumb. So, um, the thumb usually squeezes when the bow hand doesn't feel supported and you want the bow hand to feel supported with your natural body weight in the arm so if you're noticing your thumb is tight and wanting to squeeze i would ask well is my elbow low am i sinking in is my shoulder hiked up you don't want that so you have to see that this is um, released, unhinged, relaxed. I try to give more words other than relaxed because if you're not relaxing and that's the issue, if, if I could relax, I would. If it was that easy, we all would. So try to think of different ways. So the idea of when you just let your arm hang, and you don't do anything, you just let it hang there. That's how it should feel when you have your bow on the string and you're holding it. Your arm should feel that loose. And then the wrist is what helps you to get on the different strings, a little bit of your arm, but generally this part kind of stays the same. So I would check that out because if you're hiked up and you don't feel any contact, any weight helping you sink into the string, you might squeeze and hold on. So that's kind of step one. Now, having the thumb bend and not be locked is kind of the second most common issue. 
And a big, uh, nice way to practice new techniques is your scales. So you can have your fingers draped, including the thumb, at the frog a little bit more uh, flat. And my thumb, it's not locked, but it's, it's a calm thumb. I'm not curved yet, so I'm at the frog. And then um, I'm going to play, let's do A. So I start with the flat fingers. And then I pick them up. Oh, you can't see on Instagram because it's portrait mode. Boo. Okay. I know I'm not sitting in my chair right, but this is really quick. So I pick up with my hand. You see how my fingers are now curling? So I start um, flat, draped, relaxed. And then I open up. I curl my fingers. I curl them. I reach into the string and pick up the sound and everything's curled so you can check is the thumb curled that's the big question so you start with the curled finger you have the next note you relax the drape and now you're back to draped and relaxed fingers relaxed thumb frog means flat ff frog means flat tip means turned i don't know i need i need a um i need an alliteration frog means flat tip means i don't know <laughs> i'll think of something in a second so those um that's kind of what you can do with your scales and then if if that's really difficult loop the loop the thumb in the tip so you don't drop it do flat up down and up these are bow push-ups these are great these are awesome these are amazing for finger um having individual finger control and for getting used to this without playing on the string because sometimes that's a lot of variables. So just isolate this motion. Now I'm not doing this. I'm not doing this with the wrist. It's all with the fingers. So I'm curled, including the thumb, flat, and the thumb. Okay? Oh, I really want to give you an alliteration for the tip. Frog means flat. Tip means... I don't know, tucked, tuck, I don't know, something to do with a curl. Um, I hope that helps. At least flat at the frog helps, and then you know the other end is curled. Okay, um, question from YouTube. I'm playing Elgar's second movement right now, and I'm having trouble getting it staccato and up to speed. Do you have any tips? Also, I love you, Miss Doll. Oh, thank you. I love my dolls, too. Thanks. So you're talking about staccato on the Elgar second movement. Also known as spiccato at this point because there's a small difference. Staccato means short. Um, means your bow, your hair does not leave the string, but the stick is bouncing. That, that's a big difference. Spiccato, your hair does not leave the string, but the stick is bouncing. So I would pick the first note, A, of the big fast section. see it on YouTube um, but the 
my stick is bouncing, but my hair is not. And experiment to get that stroke. That's the, honestly, there are a couple tricks I'll tell you, but to do all of these in your practice room, just on one note, I mean, you don't have to do it for hours, but really like experiment for 10 minutes, different ways to see what happens. Again, if you're suspending anything up here, bouncing is almost impossible because the big difference also between staccato and spaccato is speed. Spaccato is when you're going so fast, the stick naturally bounces. And that's kind of what you want for this concerto movement. You want it to be flashy and fast. So a couple things you can do. So I'm doing one, 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 double, 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 double. So you can do short little bursts like that. Also experiment with the angle of the bow. That is something that took me a while uh, to really experiment with. And it actually can be a game changer, the angle of the bow. So I'm not saying don't play crooked, but you might need to be a little, a little this way or a little, a little this way. I find being a little bit, a little bit this way where you're reaching out a little bit more with the frog, I think tends to help a little bit. So yeah, I would say start with one note, then do bursts of two, four, um, eight, 12, and you can do it. You can try and leave the hair in the string. That's a very, um, big temptation is to bounce. Sorry. It's so dark. We had a cloud rolling just now and it looks really dark, but it's not that bad. So sorry. <laughs> doing tap tap um da, da. it's like little flicks with the wrist and if you notice i want to clean up my tone a little bit so that means i gotta just sink in with a little more of my body weight into the string i'm a little too light that's why it's not super crisp difference excuse me um experimenting with your arm weight so we talked about having the um hair in the string not hopping not leaving the string making sure you're low and cozy here flicking with the wrist and your bow angle the final thing i will tell you if you are trying and trying and you go nothing is working what is happening? Take a break, come back to it tomorrow, because you might get in your head. That happens a lot if we work on a technique too much. But also, your bow might be too loose or too tight. So that is the final piece after you go through everything else. See if the bow is too tight or too loose. If it's too loose, you're not gonna get that crisp reaction. If it's too tight, you're not gonna be able to sink into the string and you're gonna feel like you're working hard. So um, check on your bow. I find for spiccatos, I tend to like it like a little, little tiny twist, a little tighter than my default bow. Final question, because we're coming to our close, my dolls, on Cello Tip Tuesday. I'm so sorry. You all have wonderful questions. So this one um, I will do last from YouTube. How long before you started noticing your cello opening up? I will say that's gonna be happening your whole cello journey. 
you will achieve new levels of opening up on your instrument. New levels of this. New levels of chowly. <laughs> um, so this is something that's going to go on throughout, um, throughout your cello career. You know, even though I made, even though I got into a conservatory for college, I still discovered new ways to open up my sound and my bachelor's and my master's and so on. But I will say, I think I noticed some big differences in my sound. When I was a beginner, every couple years, I really noticed my sound opening up. And then as I got into college and the training became more intense, more finite, more focused, and you're working on the last five or 10% that you need, the growth is a little slower in a way because you're at a certain point and you really got to work hard for that last five or 10%. And then the last 5%, I mean, the last 5%, I feel like, I'll be working on forever. Never stop learning and working on, you know, cello skills and, um, but I would say, you know, every couple years, you will, I really hope you have some sort of epiphany that improves your sound. And I will say sound is a lot of bow work. We get so caught up in, am I playing the right notes? How's my tuning? How's all of this? But, it's the bow. The bow is very much your gateway to your sound. So if you don't feel content with your sound, do some open strings. Look for etudes we were talking about with long sustained notes and really work on your sound. If you're playing a lot of fast music, of course you gotta play fast music and you need to learn how to play it well. But if that's all you do, then you're missing out on projection and long bows and big sound. And again, scales are great. Scales are great for that. I've been doing, I've been challenging myself recently. I've been doing eight beat long bows, one note to a bow. So eight beats on a bow. And it's kind of a slow metronome, like 80. And I really focus on smooth changes at the frog and the tip and not having my sound waver. So you can try eight beats in your scales. And yeah, so I would say if, if you find, if you wanna progress faster with your sound, uh, bow technique, bow technique. The left hand is important, of course. And you gotta make sure you're nice and weighted in the string, you never squeeze, you, you, you're leaning down into the neck you know, having that good content will, having that good contact will, um, having that contact will allow your, your note to resonate cleanly. But again, it's very much bow related. So if it takes a few years, that's completely normal. Don't worry about it. That's the short answer. That's what I should have started with. My dolls, this has been a great live stream. Thank you all so much. Um, I love these monthly talks we have together and thank you so much. Have a happy time practicing this week and Shelly and I will see you soon for some more tips. Thank you all so much for your kind words in the chat and for joining me today. And as always, happy practicing my dolls. Bye-bye.